So, hey everyone, thank you for coming to the uh, Social Media Career Speaker Series sponsored by Social Media Studies at Duke, uh, Duke i &E, uh, Duke MMS, and Demon. Uh, today we have got uh, a really interesting guest. I'm excited to have him. We got Max Reisinger uh, coming to us. He is a YouTuber. Uh, building a big old audience uh, on YouTube, obviously. Uh, he's 17 years old out of Chapel Hill, right? And uh, we're going to talk a bit about what it means to uh, to kind of work on social media, specifically on YouTube, and build an audience over there. Uh, we're going to focus our questions again uh, when we tend to think about careers in social media. You know, really, you know, the kind of the management side and building and operations, maybe a little less on the you know, content choices, uh, things like that. Uh, because again, this is all about thinking like, what is it like to actually grow an audience? How do you go about it? How do you approach it? So uh, so Max, thank you so much for being here and chatting with us today. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, it's kind of weird. I feel like I'm talking to a YouTube video now because I like been watching YouTube videos and like this is the same background that uh, in a lot of your videos. So that's like an interactive YouTube video, kind of crazy. Um, so uh, I want to just go ahead and uh, kind of open the floor. Oh, uh, one other caveat to everyone here. You know, obviously you're welcome to ask questions uh, as we go. Um, I've got a list of questions that a lot of people have submitted ahead of time that I'll kind of use to guide the questions. Uh, again, I'll try to use your questions opposed to mine. Uh, feel free to put them in the chat or, uh, you know, if it's appropriate, interrupt us and ask a question in, in the moment. Um, so let me go ahead and just kick things off, though, by saying, Max, well, you know, welcome. And uh, if you don't mind, can you start by you know, telling us a little about yourself? Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me here. First off, I'm really excited for this. Uh, so my name is Max Reisinger. I'm 17. I live in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I'm currently a senior at Chapel Hill High School. Um, so two years ago, I started a YouTube channel because my mom went on sabbatical and my whole family moved to France for seven months. Uh, I decided to start filming videos of my experiences, documenting what it's like to be an American teen. Um, I filmed some videos going to school there, which eventually blew up when I moved back home to America. Uh, and the channel blew up, started a business uh, all while in high school. I run cross country and track. And uh, ever since then, that's just kind of what I've been up to. Cool. Uh, so uh, just to go ahead and kind of get started in, in learning a bit about how you got into doing YouTube videos, I guess, what was your, uh, what made you want to create videos in the first place? So I've always been interested in filmmaking. Um, but with the opportunity of moving to France, I wanted to be able to look back on my experiences because I knew it'd be a pretty pivotal moment for my life. Uh, and I didn't want to just look back at photos. I wanted to like have something that I could, you know, like watch, you know, my whole, um, sort of thing was I want my kids to be able to watch these videos someday, uh, and just something to have looking back on my life. Um, so I decided to start a YouTube channel, put myself out there and yeah, just, I wanted something more than just photos to look back. Yeah, as someone, kids, yeah. as someone with kids, yeah, someone with kids, trust me, you don't, you don't want your kids knowing you when you were, when you were this age. <laughs> out there. Um, there's something weird going on with your audio. It's cutting. It's not. It's, it's not necessarily cutting in and out, but it's like going up and down a lot. I'm not sure maybe why, but I just figured I would mention it in case there's a, an easy fix. Um, okay, I could try with my headphones off. But... Yeah, maybe let's see if that. Can you hear me speaking? Uh, yeah, that's perfect. You sound better? Yeah, I think so. Okay, sweet. Um, okay, so uh, let me get, jump right into questions here. This first question is from uh, Jonah. Throughout all of your social media accounts, uh, including Instagram, you really have a cohesive brand strategy. How would you describe your strategy and content preferences uh, and kind of what goal do you have for your online persona? All right, the last little bit just cut off. I missed the last mm -hmm. sentence. All right. All right, uh, so <laughs> no worries. Uh, Zoom. Uh, okay, so let me try. I'll just read it again. Your okay. social media accounts, uh, including Instagram, you seemingly have a cohesive brand strategy. How would you describe your strategy, your brand strategy, and your content preferences? And then the kind of the piggyback on that is what goal do you have for where you want to bring that strategy? Yeah, great question. 
Uh, so for me in the beginning, I didn't really have a clear strategy. I think it's something over time I realized, oh, it's good to have any, everything kind of like go together. Um, I think over time I realized my brand should really just be myself, you know, like my authentic version of myself and sort of telling the story of who I am and not trying to necessarily, like I don't try to fit it to have things look a certain way. It's more just like, this is me. And I think that's just something very simple that I can stick to. Um, I think highlighting my personality uh, has been really helpful and something I can just go back to. Um, but with like social media, like Instagram, for example, like there's not really a clear strategy. It's just like, oh, there happens to be a photo of me. I'll post it. Um, but I think the underlining kind of message to my videos and just my whole brand in general tends to be around optimism. And I think if I can try to tie in whatever media I'm putting out back to something sort of optimistic, uh, then that's what I try to do, whether it's through videos or maybe a caption on Instagram posts or a story or just little things I can do to kind of go back to maybe changing someone's perspective or making someone's day a bit better. That's sort of what I go back to. And yeah, out of curiosity, what, you know, what drives you to do that? Why, why are you interested in making strangers days better? <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that's a bad thing. Just, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah just, yeah. Um, I think it's because it's, simple things like that that other people have done have really affected me in profound ways so like even like a quote that someone shared on their story has really changed my day uh, in the past and it still does um and i think over time through like feedback like i'll post a video and i'll get a bunch of messages maybe even emails and you get really genuine responses from people who are touched by it or help them see something in a different way and it's not that it's like addicting but like when you get the reward or sort of like the feedback that it can actually help people um it's just like a very simple thing I can do. I know that it helps, so it's like, might as well, you know, it's kind of fun. I noticed that, you know, something I, I particularly enjoyed about your videos that you, you talk about is the you know, kind of the importance of providing value uh, in the content that you're creating to your audience. How do you think about providing value and, and what kind of value do you feel like you're providing to, to your users? Great question. Uh, yeah, I think over time, as my audience grew larger, I realized that there's a responsibility that comes with having an audience and speaking about certain things and the, the perspectives I share and the opinions I have. Um, and yeah, I think providing value is really important. I think on YouTube or social media in general, there's a lot of like fluff and a lot of like consumption that's just attention and not necessarily meaningful all the time. Uh, I've tried to share things in an interesting way that someone could take something away from my video and or Instagram post or whatever it is. Um, I try to, to maybe maybe have a message or just a small takeaway because I think that I don't know it's meaningful. You know, I don't want to just be putting things out to be putting things out to get likes to get views. Uh, I want to actually change people's perspectives and make a difference, um, not in like a cheesy cliche way, but I'd rather be proud of what I'm making um, because there have been times where I make something and maybe it was more like to get views or get likes and it just doesn't sit right with me. Um, so yeah, I just try to be genuine with that. That makes sense. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, well, yeah, so, okay. So that's interesting. Cause that, that's obviously something that's evolved over time because you started, you said, you know, I was just creating this for, for myself and, and maybe my kids in the future. Um, and, and then it seems like looking at your account that it was your kind of your, your content related to, uh, being in schools is, is what blew up. So one of the questions that we got coming in was, um, do you have any idea as to why your kind of your American and French public school content blew up? Uh, and, you know, any insights into maybe why that started to happen? Yeah, I think that specific question is something I wrestled with a lot because those videos essentially changed my life. Like so many things, like my whole life now is basically based upon YouTube and what I'm doing. And if the, those videos didn't blow up, I'd be in a completely different doing something very different so I thought about that a lot um I think what it comes down to is I was able to show something really unique that not everyone gets to see right the inside of a French public school inside of American public school it's very interesting uh to everyone because that's something everyone can relate to everyone's gone to school but everyone's curious uh to see what other people's experiences are like um and especially with the French public school video is from the perspective of an American kid. So I think that adds 
even more interest to the video uh, because it's new, it's very different. I don't necessarily speak the language, so it adds a lot more variables. Um, and then also like school vlogs in the past aren't always the best quality. Um, I think I added some extra filmmaking drone shots to make it more interesting. Um, but maybe it's just luck, who knows? <laughs> it's hard to pinpoint it back to one thing, but I think it just told an interesting story. And I think watching them back, you could see how I was nervous, how I was vulnerable. And I think it just told an interesting story. Um, so yeah, maybe that's why. Uh, well, so to, to piggyback then, uh, kind of another question came in, uh, so you mentioned in an article, a 2020 article that you aren't sure why the YouTube algorithm has promoted your videos, uh, but that was a little while ago. How do you feel now? Do you have a better sense of how the algorithm works? Um, any insights you can give us on, you know, what is what makes content on YouTube successful or unsuccessful? Yeah, yeah, I think in the beginning on YouTube, you sort of view this the algorithm as some like grand thing that you don't have no control over. Um, and over time, I've sort of figured out what works and what doesn't. Um, I think it's pretty simple. You know, if a video is interesting and it's compelling and it keeps people watching, it's going to do well. You know, if you publish a video and it's 10 minutes and the average person watches seven or eight minutes of that, that's incredible. Uh, and that's what YouTube wants, watch time right now from what we've been seeing at least uh, at the current moment. Um, I think it all comes down to storytelling. Uh, I think that's just very like innate to humanity. Storytelling has been going on forever. Uh, it captivates us. And if you can tell a good story, I think it's as simple as that. A good story will do well on YouTube. Uh, and I think when I focused more on interesting storytelling, it's done better. Um, but yeah, I think interesting topics that humans can relate to. Uh, I don't know. It's it's sounds very like a kind of the fluff but if I if I see like uh, a title and a thumbnail I'll know if it does well or not or I can watch a video and I can tell this is either going to perform well or not it's sort of like a intuition thing that over time you kind of learn um, but it just comes down to what interests people at the end of the day I think <laughs> wait I feel like we want more than that wait give us give us the uh, give us the specifics um, yeah. so okay well let's uh, let's go into thumbnails right so um, another question I got was uh, notice some of your videos on YouTube have thumbnails that are edited with text and effects while other videos appear to just be screen grabs from the videos. Uh, do you see a difference in the performance of those videos based on the thumbnails? And you know, how do you think about creating kind of the perfect YouTube thumbnail, which I know is obviously very important for the, the platform? Yeah, so thumbnails are really fun, uh, sometimes frustrating uh, because it, it really makes or breaks your video, right? No one's gonna click off it or click on it if it's a boring thumbnail, you know, it doesn't matter how good your video is. Uh, so it's incredibly important. Um, and it's, it's a lot of psychology, which is why I think it's really fun to create them because you're trying to get people to click, you know? <laughs> um, it's as simple as that, right? Um, but you don't wanna lead people on, you don't want it to be misleading, like, you know, clickbait is obviously a big thing in the past. Um, YouTube's gotten better at that, but I think, um thumbnails <laughs> i think it's all about trying to get people excited but not lead them on too much um and i try to uh, it's like weird because you know certain colors are going to attract people right you know if i make like a this face people are like oh maybe i'll click on that instead of i'm just like sitting like this right um so there's a lot of fun psychology in like creating certain thumbnails um but I haven't really noticed correlations because like one of my videos that went viral, one of the French public school ones, it was like a video of my, or a photo of my hand going into like a hand scanner for my lunch. And then like another one was like my face. So as long as it's sort of interesting, uh, that gets people kind of curious. I think that's what tends to work well. And an expression on your face is obviously interesting. Um, I don't know if text helps or not. Like a lot of it's kind of guess and check, but I haven't been able to like really find any sturdy correlations, if that makes sense. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. Uh, you know, I've, uh, I've spoken with a lot of kind of YouTube creators over the years, and there's definitely a, I mean, there's an art to the thumbnail. I mean, I've talked to YouTube creators, I mean, they spend more time on their thumbnails and their videos, right? Uh, yeah. And kind of workshopping. And then I also know it's, you know, as, as you pointed out, it's kind of the thing that um, as you experiment, you kind of get these, you know, feedback based on who clicks on what, and, and it kind of controls your own kind of mental uh, yeah. model of that. Ah, this is going to work or this isn't going to work. Um, Okay, so yeah, so thumbnails are obviously pretty important. Something else we think a lot about uh, in this class is posting uh, frequency and, and timing and consistency. Uh, you seem to post anywhere between one and five videos a month on your YouTube channel. Another question I'm reading here. 
Uh, how do you determine the frequency of your posts? Uh, and do you think your videos perform differently depending on when your last post was? Great question. Uh, so it all depends on what else I have going on in my life. Uh, since I'm still managing school and running, um, sometimes I have more free time, other times I don't. Uh, sometimes I get stuck on a video and instead of it taking 10 hours, it takes 40. So there's no real like reason why I post frequency or not. Sometimes I'm just not feeling it. Um, but what I've noticed, so in the past, I used to think that consistency is the most important thing on YouTube. You know, you got to post at least every week or sometimes two or three times a week. Um, and you got to develop that relationship. Um, but over time, I found that when I did that, it wasn't the best content. I was just kind of like putting it out, but I wasn't really sitting with it. And the videos performed okay, but it didn't necessarily create the momentum I was looking for. Um, but when I did post less frequently, and I put a lot more time into my videos, uh, they might not have performed well in the beginning, but sometimes like six, seven months later, the video will take off and the algorithm will push it out to a lot of people. Uh, so I found that if you just stick to making a good video, you don't worry about when you're posting it. Uh, that's what's rewarded me. Um, so I try not to worry about posting consistent, consistently if I can just focus on making a good video. Um, so if it's really good, I don't mind not posting for two months because usually it works. <laughs> so, uh, well, okay, let, let me build on that question then I'll go to the other ones asked. Uh, another question that came in is, uh, so how much in advance do you plan kind of your longer day in life videos? And you know, do you see a direct connection? It kind of sounds like you do, I guess, by the last answer. Do you see a direct connection between how much time you spend editing a video uh, and kind of the number of views that you wind up getting on it? Yeah, for sure. I think the more time I put into a video, the better it typically does, unless like the school videos are kind of easy because it's just like a vlog, you know, I'm walking around, it takes one day to film. I don't really have to think much before and it's just kind of like seeing what happens. Um, so I've gotten lucky with those, but for videos that weren't necessarily like a vlog style or day in the life, uh, I found that like the videos that I put sometimes like 40 and 50 hours in, like that sounds crazy. Uh, but if like some of those videos is just like every day for two weeks and it eventually pays off. And yeah, I think that the more time I spend, the better the video does. Um, but it's sort of like, I have a frustrating relationship with it because doing that, it doesn't like burn me out but it's very mentally tasking and you almost don't want to do that all the time because it feels like such an energy train so i'll make like a really good video and i'll be like okay i have good momentum let me make a less edited video put less time into it and see how it does and it never performs well um so i think deep down i know that the more editing i put in the better um it'll perform but it's <laughs> it's it takes a lot to edit all the time so it's kind of like a frustrating relationship not that I don't enjoy editing it, but it's mentally tasking. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I totally get that. I, you know, it's it's interesting because I because I've heard it kind of go both ways. I'm more on the like churn out content side in terms of my content creation, which is more like get it out on a regular schedule. Um, you know, with with quantity trumping quality, um, sometimes to my own de detriment. But it's you know it's it's a really tough decision to make, right? Because what can happen is you can burn your you can get really deep into one episode, one podcast, one video, and just you know spend forever on it. And then when it doesn't get the traction, you're like, oh gosh, why did I why did I spend all that time? Um, yeah, you know, the other thing I found just a random side is sometimes the things that I think are just terrible wind up hitting way better than the things that I thought were great. Um, have you had that experience too? Sometimes, but I think like I, I have a pretty good sense of if it's a good video or not. Like I, I can be pretty honest with myself. Um, sometimes I've been surprised, but for the most part. I can sort of tell if it's going to perform well or not. Um, another question that came in kind of related to that is, uh, you know, so you have a really great uh, again, production quality in all your videos. Uh, and as you noted, it takes a lot of time. Uh, do you outsource any part of your, your video creation, your editing, your channel marketing, or anything like that? Or is it all just you? So for now, it's all just me. Um, I'm pretty picky with like aesthetic and design and brand and everything. So I haven't been able to like outsource anything yet. Um, in the past, I've worked like collaborated with a friend or another artist who does like visual effects or animations. Um, but so far at the moment, everything's just me. All right. 
Uh, so I want to take a moment here to pause and open for questions. Any anyone want to jump in? Otherwise, I got I got a list. Uh, Anna. Hi. Thanks so much for talking to us. Um, I was wondering, you know, when you said you kind of kind of you know when a video is going to be successful and when it's better um, and will gain more traction, like. What do you think are the qualities in those videos that really make them better? Like, is it the content, the way you edit, like the sound? What What do you think are those are those qualities? That's a great question. Uh, I think it's really the flow of the video. Um, and so, like when I, for example, when I edit one of my own videos, I'm watching it through probably at least twenty or thirty times. Just like that's how I edit. I like go through, go through, go through, and cut it down, cut it down, cut it down. Um, and by then I've sort of like lost my mind and like, I don't even know like what the video flow is anymore. Uh, Cause you kind of get confused and kind of lost in the edit. Um, but eventually I watch it at the end. And if I don't get distracted um, and I'm like really sucked in the storytelling has good pace. I think that's what really makes a video. And obviously all the other factors like music, um, like effects, showing B-roll, all that contributes to the flow of a video. And I think, things like that if you get your music right if you get the effects right you can really suck people into the video I think it all comes down to pacing right if I talk for two minutes and I don't change like the scene or if I don't add any music you can kind of get bored if I'm not really engaging or captivating so I think it or at least what I try to do with my editing is I try to just keep the pace interesting so that you don't get distracted right how can I keep your attention for 10 minutes obviously me sitting here and talking for 10 minutes you'll probably get distracted um, but if I can change up the scene, go somewhere else, add different music, add effects um, to really bring you in as a viewer, I think that's what really makes the difference um, in a video performing well or just it being a good video. Again, that all kind of goes into the storytelling of it. Interesting. Uh, Kenya. Hi, Max. Thanks for being here with us. You really post a lot inspiring content. So thanks. Um, my question for you is how do you stay motivated in school while, you know, putting out content and managing a business? Great question. Um, I'll be honest, I don't always stay motivated with school. Uh, I think it's just inherently not as exciting as YouTube, as online content creation, which is not as interesting. Um, that's sort of just the fact of the matter. Um, I think I get motivated because I know it's important. It's sort of like, I just don't want to fail, you know, or I don't want to do bad in the class. I think it's, school's very like strict. Um, I don't know how to put it, but like, if I perform like worse, like I get a grade and I can see it, right? But with YouTube, it's more like kind of like abstract. You don't necessarily get a grade. Um, but with school, it really just keeps me focused and responsible. And I don't know, I, I think that just keeps me motivated it's not necessarily the best motivation to like not try to not fail obviously but to not perform poorly um I don't know I struggle with that if I'm being honest like I just don't find high school as interesting that's why I'm excited for college uh just different styles and teaching um I don't know the truth is I'm not always motivated but <laughs> seeing grades definitely keeps me in check <laughs> don't get too excited about college <laughs> not about trust me Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Nick, you had a question. Hey, thanks for uh, presenting today and going over all your content creation. I had a question on pretty much, so you said that you post a lot of your videos based on the enjoyment that it comes from you giving that to your audience and your viewers. I was wondering if you had thought about any monetary incentive through your platform, whether that's a brand sponsorship or um, maybe something else. Yeah. Hey, Nick, great question. Um, so obviously like there's a lot of different incentives, right? I enjoy making videos. I enjoy the effect it can have on people. Um, I think as my audience has grown there, I've been opportunities to monetize more. Um, and obviously working with brands and sponsorships, that's another form of, um, incentive at times. Like sometimes I'll have like a brand contract and I have to post a video this month. So that's definitely motivating because I have to get it out. Um, but I don't ever want to sell out. Um, so I try to keep it authentic and then have the monetary is just like an extra bonus. Um, but there's definitely times where like, I'm not as motivated, but I'm like, Ooh, I can see like ad revenues going down or like 
I think at times money is definitely an incentive. If I'm being honest, like it'd be great to get like a nice check from a brand. Um, and that's something I've struggled with, like ethically, right? Like, am I being motivated by money right now, or is it because I actually enjoy making videos? Um, that's something I've had to ask myself because I think you can get lost in it um, because it's just like a whole nother world. You're like, I mean, for right, like my first 50 videos, I didn't get paid a single cent, right? It's all out of enjoyment. But then once money kind of comes in, it sort of complicates things. Um, so yeah, I try to just keep it authentic, but you definitely have to keep yourself in check because it's easy to get lost in the ego of content creation, social media, and all that when money starts coming in. I don't know if that quite answered your question, but <laughs> try. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you again, Nick. And just so the sake of highlighting, you know, you touched on this kind of interesting part, which is, you know, as you start to get paid for content creation, you know, you start to see that certain content makes you more money, even if it's content you're not as, you know, you don't like as much. It doesn't mean it's bad content. It's just content you don't like as much. You know, uh, I think I've said in class multiple times, my, any of my content about fundraising and venture capital, you know, always makes way more money than content about, you know, uh, customer acquisition. But customer acquisition in terms of building companies is actually way more important than fundraising and venture capital. Um, and so you look at it and you say, gosh, should I create content that makes me money or should I create content that's actually good for my audience? And Oh yeah, for sure. I have definitely struggled with that too. Just like making certain types of videos, you know, like maybe I want to make a video about this, but I know it's not going to appeal to a large audience. Uh, maybe it's just not as interesting to the average viewer. So then you're you sort of just shift like if I make that video brands won't want to pay me as much uh it won't get as many views my channel won't grow as much as I want it to and I think the larger I've grown the more you kind of feel yourself getting sucked into doing what the algorithm wants what's what will get you more money what will grow your audience more um and that's not always necessarily the right thing to do but it's sort of this struggle because you kind of have to find the right balance between staying authentic right but then also allowing yourself to grow and sort of playing the game um i think that's where i'm trying to find right now is the perfect balance between me but then also kind of being strategic and doing what works um yeah i think it's a really interesting balance for sure uh benjamin you have a question yeah hi uh thank you for being here um i was curious what does networking look like as a content creator and like do you find yourself reaching out to other creators is there like a community um i was just hoping you could shed some light on that great question uh so networking is pretty casual um so having a larger instagram fall like most of networking tends to happen over instagram dms um super easy quick quick simple um, and I found that if you just have a larger following, like at least for my Instagram DMs, it ranks people uh, by how many followers you have in like my request section. So if you have 100,000 followers, you'll be on the top and I'll see you first. If you have like 10 followers, I probably won't see it. Um, so it makes it really easy when you reach out to other creators because they're going to see it first. Um, and it's sort of like that internet clout that you can kind of just float around and talk to any creator you want. Um, so I've been able to you know, people I've looked up to in the past, it's kind of crazy because they'll just DM them and they'll respond. Um, and so it's, it's really casual. You send them a DM, they'll respond, you kind of talk, you chat, maybe uh, you email them. Um, but, you know, I've worked with creators and videos in the past. It's usually goes like you DM them, they give you your number, you talk, and then you're friends. Uh, so it's pretty simple, not too complicated, but most of it from what I've seen happens on DMs. And uh, Marina. Um, hello, uh, not to sound like a broken record, but thank you for coming. Um, so you clearly have a lot of skills in video editing, but I'm wondering if there's a skill or a subject that you wish you knew more about that you think would um, advance your success on YouTube. Hmm, fair question. A skill I wish I had. I honestly really like animations and like more graphics on videos. Like if you're watching a video and something kind of pops up and it flashes or a graph moves. Um, I don't know if you guys watch Johnny Harris on YouTube, but a lot of like the maps and stuff he does or like Nathaniel Drew, like stuff like that. It probably takes like 10 to 20 hours. It looks really cool that I just don't have the time to do or I just haven't taken the time to do. Uh, I think it's like those little things that people add to their videos that really catch your eye. 
Um, it's something I wish, or maybe I'll do it in the future. I don't know, maybe I'll outsource it, but I really like the little touches and graphics and animations that people add. And Adam. I, I could say what everyone else says, but I thought I might as well throw it on real quick here. Uh, my question is, besides for focusing on like the quality of videos, do you also think partially like long-term gratification, like it could take a few months for it to take off, but it'll be worth it in the end? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think it goes back to just like really focusing on making the best video possible. And I think I've, again, tried to get out of the whole consistency mindset because I found, at least with my channel, that um, some videos take off much later on if it's like a good video. And I think in the beginning you get disappointed because maybe it doesn't perform well when you put it out. Um, and you kind of have to just like not focus on that. And then eventually like four months later, uh, it gets like a hundred thousand views in like a month and you're like, oh my gosh. Um, so yeah, I think again, just going back to making a good video and not worrying about how it performs in the first couple of days is something that is difficult as a creator because you put so much time into something and then you go on your YouTube like homepage and it's like downward like red arrows and it's saying like your video is not performing like it says like your audience isn't as interested as it normally is and you're like geez thanks you know like that doesn't feel good when you read it um and yeah I think there's just a lot of like ups and downs that I didn't realize with making videos um because it's it's pretty vulnerable you know like I'm spewing out like ideas that I have um it's like raw it's me you know it's my life um, and then here you are getting an algorithm saying, oh, people don't care about this. It's not performing well, I'm not making as much money. And you're like, ah, geez. So it's definitely like an emotional roller coaster. It also goes both ways. You know, if you post a video and it does really well, you, you, like, you feel like you're on top of the world. Um, but I think at the end of the day, yeah, just trying to make good videos and not worrying about how they perform, which is easier said than done. <laughs> yeah, you got to put yourself out there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Will, you have a question. Yeah, um, I was just curious, like, how did your, how does your age factor into brand deals and stuff? Like, especially when you first started, I would imagine it like probably wasn't super easy to like negotiate with, uh, like, well-paid adults over brand deals. And like, I know you're like, uh, you had some brand deals with some pretty large companies. So has that like been a factor? And how did you kind of learn to do that? Yeah. So, um. In the past, I've like not been able to get opportunities because of my age. I'm not 18. So they're like, oh, you're not 18. Sorry, we can't work with you. Um, but a lot of it, I've been able to like have my mom sign it, right? So like, I get adult consent and I can work with the brand, which has been really great. Um, but I think it's just like, there's a lot of unknowns with working with brands. Um, I don't have a manager uh, or anything. So I handle all the emails I get. And it's sort of weird because you don't really know your worth as a creator, right? Am I like, I don't know, am I worth a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars? I don't know, you know, but um, it's, I think it's difficult because when you're younger, you're probably not like as respected or you don't, I don't know, but <laughs> it's, it's tricky because it, it like some brands, like you feel like they don't care about your age at all. Other ones you're like, you feel like they think you're a kid. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it I don't know. I don't, I don't know. We'll see, we'll see when I turn 18 and how it works when I'm older, but so far brands have been pretty cool. Um, and yeah, I don't know. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Yeah. The money is just going to start flowing in when you're 18. It's just going to be opening up. Uh, Neha, I hope I'm saying that right. Yeah. Hi, hi, Aaron. Hi, Max. I'm I'm Neha from India, and so it's uh, can me. Can you guys hear me? Oh, we we can hear you. Yep. You you can right. Yep. Okay. Okay. So I've uh, so, so you know that was uh, just so random. I'm actually very excited right now because today I just random randomly saw Max Instagram story and it says that he's gonna be live or on Zoom. And then I got an email from Aaron where where I got an email too that I'm I can access to this meeting and I'm really feeling very lucky that I can access to Max. Um, I maybe sound weird and strange, but uh, but yes, I already know. <laughs> That's why I haven't switched on the camera. So uh, my question to Max is, um, 
as uh, Max, you are also in college. Uh, means you will also be going to college and you already have a career, a good career in, uh, in your uh, running and as a YouTuber and as, uh, you know, as you, you run a, a brand. Oh my gosh, I'm nervous. <laughs> so uh, you run a brand. So do you think that going to college is really important right now or you can just s switch? Because I I'm, I'm, will also be going to college this year too. So I just need a little your advice. Yeah. Well, so what do you say about? Yeah, we're excited to have you here. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so that's something I also thought about a long time, right? Like started my YouTube channel. I can make a lot of money. It's sort of like the dream job to be able to make videos. It's like, why would I want to go to college? You know, like this is the dream. Um, and there's like a long period of my life where I'm like, there's this big decision, right? Do I just send it? Like move to LA, you know, make videos, see yeah. where do I sort of slow down and go to college, maybe not have as much time uh, to make videos and see how that goes. Um, I think I realized that I'm very young. I have a lot, a lot of opportunity right now. But at the same time, education is really, and uh, I think I want to have like a long-term mindset with everything. And I realized that I'm willing to slow down my career uh, to really invest in myself and to learn a lot at this age, because I think it's really important. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, there's no right decision. I think that's the issue or that I've struggled with, right? Like, not going to college and pursuing YouTube full time or my business full time, that's not necessarily better than going to college. Um, I, I don't know. Like, it's still something I'm not like 100% like certain about. Uh, but I think for now, I realize that it's it's okay to slow down your career, not necessarily worry about growth or putting out videos. Um, if I can, you know, educate myself. I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, I'm going to take one more question, uh, and then we'll get back to some of, of this list here. Uh, Zog said. Uh, yeah. Th 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 thanks. Uh, hi, Max. Thanks for making like such a wonderful content on YouTube. Uh, yeah, uh, my question is, uh, what would be what would be your biggest advice for a beginner at YouTube? A beginner on YouTube? Yeah, based on your experience and your knowledge so far, like, like what one? Yeah, um, I get this question a lot. You know, it's like, should I start a YouTube channel? I'm scared to start a YouTube channel. What should I do? Uh, and I think the best advice, I think a lot of people are, especially me looking back, I was waiting for like some spark of motivation or something to you know get me to start posting videos um but i think we tend to overcomplicate it in our heads i think it's as simple as start making videos um if you can make a calendar find a way to force yourself to be consistent to at least put a video out every week um and to just be really patient like it took me seven months of working every day on my videos to get any sort of traction at all um and i think yeah you just have to consistently put it out and I think the most important thing is to realize that it could take a really long time it could take a year it could take two years um and as long as you have that long-term perspective then I think um you'll be set but obviously you have to be self-aware uh and learn as you make your videos uh I think that's just the best advice just to start putting out videos don't don't wait um I think eventually you'll learn everything you need there's no like magic like formula or key thing to do, just make good videos and over time you'll get better at that. But I think it's really as simple as that. Just so Yeah. Uh, so thanks everyone who had their hands up and, and you can keep them up. I wanna kind of drive the, the conversation, the questions here. So, you know, we've talked kind of high level and structural things that Max has done logistical. I wanna talk a bit about the business of running a, a YouTube channel. So I wanna make sure we get some questions in about this. And I guess I wanna start with the, and the ideas of um, you know sponsorships. Uh, you know, at what point did you start receiving uh, you know, opportunities to to have sponsored videos, uh, and how do you vet potential sponsors uh, as to whether or not you know, you're willing to work with them? Yeah. So this is something I was really curious about, and like in the beginning of starting my YouTube channel, like being sponsored is just like you've made it. Then um, I was really curious as well to see like. How does this work out? How does it work? Do I reach out? Do they work? Do they reach out? Uh, and so when my channel blew up, it was pretty rapid. 
Uh, so I went from like 2,000 subscribers to 40,000, and I think around a week or so. Uh, so it happened really fast. And I think when I blew up, I started getting all these emails. Um, so yeah, right around 40,000 subscribers. And after that, I get emails um, every week or so. Like it depends on how frequently you post, but what I've noticed is um, when I post more frequently, I get emails from brands. Uh, and so like when I determine like whether I want to work with a brand or not, it's really, do I know the brand first off? Because a lot of brands like I've never heard of. Um, and is it something that would, again, provide value to my audience? And I think you see some YouTubers and they post things that doesn't come off as genuine, right? They're sponsoring something, but it seems like they're just doing it for the money. Um, I think that's something I never want to do. Uh, and so I try to look at it from the outside, like as a viewer, like, is he promoting this because he actually believes in the product? Does he think it could help his audience or just he want the money? Um, and I think I try to view it from like an authentic standpoint. Um, but I've been fortunate to be able to work with like larger brands that I know and I use. And I think it just comes down to providing value. And is it something that I actually stand behind? Is it something that I use? Um, but yeah, I think, I don't know if that answers your question. Does it? <laughs> uh, it wasn't my question. It was someone else's, but, uh, but yeah, no, that's, that's great. Um, well, so building on that, you know, the other thing that we noticed, obviously we watch your, um, your channel is you've created uh, your own brand. Uh, and so what, you know, what, made you want to create your own brand versus kind of promote uh, other brands? Uh, well, you know, how, do you, how do you think about that, uh, I'll call it opportunity, uh, that business opportunity? And, um, and, and at what point did you feel like you had reached kind of a large enough audience that that was a viable strategy? Yeah. Um, so I started my clothing brand, Perspectopia, I think right after I hit 100,000 subscribers. Um, Cause by then I could really feel like I had a community on YouTube. It felt like there was an audience, like you kind of feel the excitement and the momentum on the channel. And uh, for me personally, I've always been into clothing and in a fashion um, and sort of that feeling that like you put on like a certain shirt or a certain hoodie and it, like, it makes you feel good and it gives you confidence and it makes you excited. Um, something about that feels really special. So I've always been, you know, attracted to fashion clothing, but I've never really had the opportunity to have an audience that will buy something. Uh, so the great thing about having a YouTube audience is there's a lot of like monetizing potential there, you know, they'll buy your products. Um, and yeah, I think it just, it sort of went hand in hand, right? A lot of opportunity with your audience, something I've always loved to do. And I decided to start the brand. Um, and I think the great thing about that is, you know, basically when you have like a loyal audience, they're willing to support anything you do for the most part. And I think I was just really lucky. Like if I didn't have the YouTube audience, I don't think the brand would be successful. Uh, it definitely wouldn't have taken off in the same way. So that's sort of the thing, you know, people say like the rich get rich. The thing with like content creation is once you already have an audience, it makes everything else a lot easier. Uh, so I've been incredibly fortunate to just leg up so much easier. Um, so yeah, it's, Definitely like YouTube has make, made everything easier, business, all of that, having an audience, people who buy your stuff. Um, you don't have to worry about marketing because you are the marketing. Um, so it's kind of nice how it goes hand in hand. Yeah, that's a, you know, kind of a, a great point. And, you know, and something that a lot of entrepreneurs understand it's, you know, audience start, you know, uh, business start with audiences, not products. Uh, mm -hmm. And so this kind of ability to create audience and, and grow it and then start to sell a product is, you know, it's kind of a, the more efficient, well, I don't say more efficient, it's a more effective strategy for, for building successful companies. Um, okay, so uh, then thinking about the uh, business side of it, well, actually, let me just go to a couple more questions here. Uh, Tara, you had a, your hand up for a little while. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so first of all, I wanna thank you for creating the amazing videos you do and helping many of us in our lives. Um, so my question for you is, what advice would you give to athletes or people aspiring to, to be athletes? Interesting. Uh, just to athletes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, like just in general or about anything specifically? Uh, yeah, I guess in general. I mean, I think athletics are really important. A lot of like like my routines and a lot of like the habits I've developed over time and the discipline that I've 
had to sort of like figure out with YouTube and running a business has come from running. Um, I think athletics are really important. It teaches you a lot. Um, mm. I think it's, I don't know, like important to find a balance uh, with them. And I don't know, like, I think it's provided a lot for me in my life um, running. You know, it's been a good outlet for me. And I think it's just important to have fun with them at the end of the day, you know, to enjoy it uh, and to get as much as you can from the experience. I don't know, it's a pretty broad advice. I don't know, specifically, like, <laughs> um, okay, I guess you can go for running or like track in general. Okay. Yeah, I think it's important to listen to your body, obviously, to have like a good coach uh, and to set good goals. Um, but I don't know, it's like general life advice, you know. <laughs> Got you. Thank if can, you. If I can piggyback on it and in relation to social media, you talk a bit about managing your brand on your, your online brand and persona the challenges you kind of have ba balancing kind of work life as we'll call it and you know kind of your normal life yeah the challenges yeah what are the, yeah what are the challenges of kind of balancing being a, a student or whatever career you might have along with trying to be a creator yeah I think the challenge is that it's hard to do every area a hundred percent so there's like a lot of sacrifices within the lifestyle um if I want to edit all the time, uh, like you'll lose sleep. And then that kind of eats into like how you perform when you run or how you feel throughout the day. Um, and so I've struggled to, you know, over time to find that right balance. Cause usually like one area of my life is going to suffer. If I'm working more and I'm working more in school, I'm going to sleep less. So that kind of affects running. But if I'm running more, I'm a lot more fatigued and I feel tired and I don't want to edit or I don't want to film. Um, so I think, you know, I'm, introverted very introverted I always have been and so filming is like not like it's not my thing but it takes a lot of energy uh and I ha kind of have to like feel like filming because I don't want to force it um but it's hard to pivot from like doing schoolwork to being tired to then having to like wake yourself up and show your personality and film I think it's sort of balancing between you know the different personas that you have for yourself um that can be really like mentally tasking uh and I think it just comes down to like energy levels. But what I have found, I'll say, is that sleep, it kind of is like the common denominator. If I can get a good night of sleep, I can sort of do everything. Uh, but once I sort of dip into like my sleep, everything kind of like goes loose. Um, I'd say my biggest struggle is just the energy between everything, if that makes sense, and finding the time <laughs> as well. Gotcha. Well, you know, and, and recognizing that so you can't do everything, right? There's no... Yeah, it's just impossible. So some things have to be cut. One thing I always tell my entrepreneur students, yeah, my usually my best, my best entrepreneur students are my worst students in terms of grades and work. And yeah, and that's that's kind of part of it, right? You you know, there's only so many hours in a day, and so learning to accept that that's okay is, as I think, a, a consistent theme I've seen among creators, because it's all encompassing. I mean, it's it's not a nine to five for sure. Yeah. Uh, Christine, you've had your hand up for a little while. Go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kristen Cecilia. I'm from Indonesia, as you know, Bali. And I love your video, videos, Max. Thank you so much. It's really inspiring. Your vlogs, your French school vlogs, and everything about it. I really love it. And I just want to ask this simple question is how you gain your confidence in public or in camera? Thank you. Uh it's not easy. <laughs> uh, it's pretty terrifying, you know, to walk around with like a big camera. You look like a fool and you're worried, like, what are people thinking about me? Uh, and the truth is like, it, it, it never goes away. You don't like event, like someday wake up and you just don't care what other people think. Um, I think it's just about like realizing that, you know, <laughs> you're going to look silly. You're going to look funny. And you kind of have to accept that. Um, I don't know, like, it, it always is awkward filming in school, you know, all those videos, it, it's never, like, never gets that much easier, if I'm being honest, I honestly, like, I expected it to be, like, all right, now I have, like, 100,000 followers, I'll have, like, more confidence because of that, and I won't care what other people think, but, you know, I still did, um, but I think, I don't know, like, it's not something I'm perfect at either, like, I still struggle, you know, sometimes caring, or I'll try to film, and I'll be, like, ah, people are watching, I won't film, so it's not something that, once you have a following, you have infinite confidence about. Um, but sometimes 
what I found to help with confidence in filming in public in general is really thinking about the story in the video that you're trying to create and trying to shut your mind off. Um, I know that kind of sounds like, I guess the concrete advice I'd give is if you can really focus on what you're trying to create and why you're creating it, it can kind of noise out all the distractions around you and thinking about what other people think about you or worrying about them judging you. Um, but it's not easy. Like I'm trying to give good advice, but it's, it's daunting. It's scary to film. It's awkward at times. And I think it's something I struggle with the most is definitely the confidence with speaking. Cause it's not something I'm naturally, or I have been naturally good at. Um, so I think it's like, it's an ongoing struggle with yourself, like discipline, like working hard. It's never going to get easier. It's just something you kind of have to figure out how to cope with your whole life. At least for me, that's how it's been. And so to, to piggyback on that question, I had a question that came in, which I thought was uh, really interesting. It was that um, in, uh, in, October, uh, in October 2020, you tweeted, quote, uh, research idea, colon, studying the long-term effects of editing videos of oneself on mental health and self-image. The concept of editing yourself already sounds unhealthy, but to rely on the direct correlation of how you edit yourself for incoming success is concerning. I can imagine you probably had just spent a long time looking at yourself, editing yourself when you tweeted that. You're like, holy cow, it's weird to just be staring at yourself. So, uh, and then the remainder of the questions, have you felt pressure or negative mental health effects from your job, from your work? Uh, how does editing slash rewatching clips of yourself affect your personal well-being? Great question. Yeah, to be honest, it's just weird to like, like to have, like I've just created like a different relationship with myself through editing, you know, like, that I didn't have before and that most people don't have, you know, most people don't stare at themselves all day long and like edit out things they like, it's weird because you have to be incredibly critical with yourself. Like that's the whole point of editing, right? You're going to edit out the boring parts, the parts where you messed up, the parts that aren't as interesting. And it's kind of brutal, you know, to watch yourself for hours where like, yeah, it's just, it's, I don't know, like, I guess I'm kind of worried because I don't know how it affects me, you know, like, I don't know if it's changing the way I act or making me do like, because you realize, like, to step it back a sec, um, I know that if I act certain ways, right, like over time, you can sort of hack things. If I act a certain way, people are gonna engage with it more. You know, if I start dancing in a video or kind of act funny or tell a joke or do something silly, I know my audience is gonna engage with that more than me acting this way. And I think, over time with editing, I'm creating this version of myself that I'm showing to the world. Um, it can't always be 100% me because I'm controlling what people get to see. Um, I think that's super interesting and almost concerning, you know, because I'm trying to create this image. But is this the image I want to be creating? Am I creating it for the right reasons? Is it because I want it to perform well online? Is it because I want it to look well for brands? And I think it's sort of dangerous because in the beginning you know you're not really thinking about this as much but then over time you realize if I act this way it's going to do better so then why would I act this way you know what if this isn't really who I am but I'm just doing this and I think that's the ethical kind of thing that I've run into with YouTube is how much do I stay myself and how much do I do what I know is going to perform well I think that's really just like scary and something that I wrestle with um but yeah, editing, it's, it's just weird, you know, to just look at yourself all the time and edit that. Um, I think it's definitely unhealthy. Uh, and I think there are negative mental health issues that come with that. Um, there's times where I'll just get really frustrated with my past self because I'll mess up. Like I struggle with like speaking and a lot of my clips, I mess up or I fumble. And I'm just like, gosh like you're, you're really harsh on yourself and I'll like get up I'll just have to like clear my head because I'll just get not like frustrated but sort of frustrated um but it's like weird because you're frustrated at yourself in the past for acting a certain way um I don't know like that that definitely gets to you but then there's other times where you're like oh I'm glad I did this um but yeah I don't know it's it's definitely interesting I'd love to do some research on how this you know shapes me in the next 5 10 15 years and how I don't know, because it's a very, like, pivotal moment, you know, like, adolescence, like, you're becoming who you are, your personalities are coming out, but now I'm, like, editing my personality, 
and then like am i acting like max or i'm acting like youtube max like i could go on and on but i don't know it's it's really interesting <laughs> that was a lot <laughs> no, no, that was, that was like a great and kind of a great bit of you know, vulnerability and, and honest, you know, again, having spoken with just so many YouTube creators over the years, it's, um, you know, it, there, there is this personality that gets created and then there's the real person and, you know, figuring out where the balance is, is, is always, it's one of the, it's one of the things people never think about when they're watching a YouTuber or any social media or any celebrity, right? You're watching, you know, whoever on, you know, Brad Pitt, right? Like there's still, there's the character and then there's the actual person. And they almost, you know, they, their places, they certainly diverge. Um, so we're running out of time uh, and there's a couple of questions. I just want to make sure we get in here. Uh, the first is where do you think things are going? Uh, where, where do you hope to bring things in the future? Uh, how are you seeing this as a, a, as a career and what are your aspirations? Yeah. Also, I don't mind going over time if that's possible. Like I'll, I'll stay and answer questions if we can do that. <laughs> we don't have to worry about that. Uh, but as a career, um, so yeah, again, I'm at this pivotal moment where I'm about to turn 18 next month, got to go to college, you know, I'm going to leave my home, all the comforts of that. Um, I have this YouTube channel and like right now I could probably theoretically, you know, make a living. I could live out on my own um, and that's scary, but also like really exciting and powerful that I could create content and make a living off of that. Like that's sort of the dream. Um, and the thing is like I'm 17 and so much can change in the next five years and I love what I'm doing now but it's just it's really hard to say or to even know you know like if my videos are even going to be performing well in five years will people care what I'm saying will I still be able to make good videos that stay up with the time you know like there's so much unknown and I think that's the sort of scary part with this is that just because it's working now doesn't mean it's going to be working in two years and I think that's something that motivates me you know as I'm making videos now, I'm trying to create that relationship with my audience. I'm trying to build my brand and have things that are outside of just an algorithm. I, I guess like you don't want to just rely on that because that's the scariest thing. Because um, if YouTube one day decided to stop putting out my videos to my audience, what would I do? You know, if I was living out on my own, I'm not getting as many views, I'm not getting brand deals, I'm not getting AdSense, I'm not making money. And then what next, you know? Um, so I think, it's it's scary you know to think about the future but at the same time um it's working now which is great i don't, I don't know i think i want to be doing this and i want to be self-sustaining for as long as i can be uh, because obviously this is an incredible job to have um but i don't know what the youtube like scene will look like in five years um but i'm just trying to create things that are long lasting building relationships being authentic that hopefully will last five, 10, 15 years so I can have a long lasting career, hopefully. That's fair. Um, so I'll tell you what, well, um, we have my wrap up question and then if people need to get going, they can. I see there's been a couple of hands up for a while that I can bring in after, uh, but the, the wrap up question I always like to ask is, normally I'm talking to somebody who's maybe, you know, 30 or 40 and I'm like, well, you know, go back in time. Now I'm gonna say go back in time to like last week, I guess. Um, <laughs> go back in time to, you know, when you were first starting out on YouTube, uh, you know, what would you, what piece of advice would you give yourself, uh, as kind of a, kind of a, what do you wish you had known then that you know now? Looking back, great question. Um, I wish I was just easier on myself. I think it's really easy to be hard on yourself when you can compare yourself like, like creating content, it's very vulnerable. Putting yourself out on social media, it's pretty vulnerable. It's scary. Um, and I think I measured what I was doing in maybe ways I shouldn't have. Maybe I was measuring my videos being as worthy as how many views they got. And maybe that wasn't how I should be viewing things. Um, or I think you start to define yourself as how well your content performs. And I think that can be really unhealthy because video could not perform well, but then maybe it performs well in five months, then you're like, why did I beat myself up for a week when it didn't perform well? Um, and I think I just wish I had a healthy relationship with myself in the beginning. So I think it's easy to look at what someone who's like 25 years old, what they're doing on YouTube, they're making incredible videos, but they've been doing this for five years. I think it's really easy to compare yourself to people. And I think that's also just really dangerous. And I wish I didn't do that. Um, and 
yeah, I think just looking out for myself and being patient is something I wish I did. Um, but I think you learn that over time. But yeah, I guess that's what I tell myself. Just be be nicer to yourself. <laughs> But yeah, you know, it's, it's something I, again, I see a lot is that you know, people forget, you know, you see someone with a million subscribers and forget that they've been doing it for seven or eight years, right? And you start on, you know, and you're in week four uh, and forgetting that, well, it's not like they overnight got that. You know, there's a, there's a lot of time and you can, you can accomplish, you usually accomplish less in a small amount of time than you think you're going to accomplish and you accomplish a lot more in a large amount of time. Uh, and so give yourself that space. Well, um, thank you so much for, for joining us. As I said, I'm going to use this opportunity to or as I like, cut the recording and, and say I, I, you're dismissed if you were here for, uh, for class or for any other reason you have to go. Uh, there are a few people who have had their hands up. So if you're willing to stick around, Max, um, we'll go ahead and let you do that. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And we'll let you know when the next, uh, the next one of these is. We should have it starting again next semester. Um, cool.